Hillary Clinton just made a trip to Iowa, does that mean she's made up her mind to run for president? AEI's Norm Ornstein will give us the details on this episode of Election Countdown. Let's talk about a topic near and dear to the political corner's heart, Hillary Clinton. Clinton visited Iowa last weekend for the Harkin Steak Fry, which has traditionally been attended by Democrats seeking the presidency. Not surprisingly, this appearance fueled discussion about Hillary Clinton running for president. With us this week to discuss this and a few other topics is AEI resident scholar Norm Ornstein. Norm, thanks for being here. Oh, delighted, Jennifer. So Hillary Clinton says that she's really not going to make up her mind officially on whether to run for president until early next year, but come on, does this mean she's running? Uh, she offered the broadest of broad hints. I mean, there were three reasons for uh, Hillary to be in Iowa. One, the Clintons are very close to Tom Harkin, who's retiring this time, and the steak fries are important one. to him. Uh, a second reason is that uh, Iowa's ground zero at this point for control of the Senate. It's a very tight Senate race. The polls show it's a toss-up. So the Clintons are in there to try and help Bruce Braley, the Democrat. But the third reason, and certainly the most important, is to put that flag out there. There's no reason for Hillary Clinton to formally announce until the last possible minute. Once she does, she will be a target for everybody. But what she wants to do is to make it clear that she is going to be making this uh, journey, and she did that pretty well in Iowa. Right. Making appearances in those early primary states like Iowa and New Hampshire is usually a sure sign that uh, somebody is considering a presidential run at least. So in those next few months before she actually does make that announcement, are there any other clues that we should be looking for from her? Uh, we're going to be seeing her travel around the country. And of course, with all of these tight Senate races and some gubernatorial contests, she has every reason to do so. Uh, my guess is she'll be back in Iowa because while Iowa is a early uh, state, it's the caucus state, she really flopped there in 2008. That was mm -hmm. the beginning of the end uh, of her presidential campaign. It was the vaulting point, the takeoff point for Barack Obama. So she really, really does not want to have something like that happen again. Right. Now, I was one of those states that we're watching really closely. Another state that we are watching very closely is Kansas. And one of the things that I want to talk about right now is what's the matter with Kansas? We don't usually think about Kansas as a purple state, but this year it's home to two of the closest midterm elections. Governor Sam Brownback is facing a very difficult road to re-election. Senator Pat Roberts is experiencing a very strong challenge from an independent candidate, businessman Greg Orman. Norma, I want us to explore both of these races, but let's start with the governor's race. Why is Brownback, who won in 2010 with 63 percent of the vote, why is he having such a tough time this year? This is still a Republican state, but there are several reasons why Sam Brownback uh, is in serious trouble. Uh, the first really is a, a struggle within the Republican Party. Brownback, along with some of his allies, including most notably the Koch brothers, poured a lot of money in the primary elections for the state legislature last time, uh, basically targeting the moderate uh, and moderately conservative Republicans in the legislature. They knocked most of them off and replaced them with hardline conservatives. Now those moderates uh, in the establishment of the Republican Party in Kansas are fighting back. In fact, one of the ones who was knocked off is actually the Democratic candidate against the very political uh, Republican Secretary of State, Chris Kobach. Uh, at the same time, the policies that Brownback was able to implement after getting a legislature to his liking, deep cuts in taxes, deep cuts in programs like education, have been very unpopular in the state, and there's a backlash against them. So Brownback right now is the second most vulnerable Republican governor uh, just behind Tom Corbett of Pennsylvania, who's losing by a substantial margin. Right. And is Brownback's unpopularity, especially among members of his own party, the reason why Roberts is having such a tough time in the Senate race? Certainly the uh, division in the Republican Party isn't helping Pat Roberts, but there's some other reasons there, too. Roberts had not had a residence in the state, had really become uh, a figure of Washington, had not had uh, any kind of a campaign uh, through most of his career, was extremely rusty. He had a challenge from a, a pretty radical uh, conservative uh, that he fended off in the primary with help from the Republican Party, but it wounded him and left him vulnerable, not so much to a Democrat. The Democratic candidate was struggling and dropped out of the race, but an independent who says, I'm going to try and solve problems, whichever party works best, who's 
self-financed and also used to be a Republican for a mm -hmm. time while also right. having been a Democrat, uh, is now posing a real challenge. I don't think a Democrat could win in a state that's still very Republican. That independent right now is running at least even with and maybe even ahead of Pat Roberts. The party's now sent in reinforcements to try and get some professionals running a campaign that has been anything but professional. Now one of the reasons we're watching Kansas so closely is, um, is not just the interesting stuff going on there, but the fact that um, the control of the Senate is very much up in the air right now. Democrats right now have control of the Senate, but two of the political prognosticators that we most closely watch, Charlie Cook and Stu Rothenberg, each recently predicted that the GOP would pick up at least seven states this November. Um, so, Norm, what do you think? Right now, is Republican control of the Senate a good bet? I would say they have a, a very good shot at it, but it's still too early to tell. Uh, the Republicans need to pick up six seats net. And, of course, it's a great year for them because there are a lot of Democrats who are up. People who won in 2008, which was a terrific Democratic year, many of them, of course, in states that uh, are very firmly Republican, that Mitt Romney carried by a substantial margin. So they've got real troubles there. Mm -hmm. But they can't really afford to lose any of their own. And with Kansas, uh, which came from nowhere as a potential pickup for Democrats, with Mitch McConnell still uh, struggling, although he's, by all standards, a little bit ahead in Kentucky, with Georgia, uh, an open seat that Republicans have held for some time, where the Democratic candidate is Michelle Nunn, the daughter of the former Senator Sam Nunn, uh, they have three at least opportunities. Pick up any one of those, and then the Republicans have to do uh, even better than they would have anticipated. Uh, right now, just given what usually happens in midterm elections, the disillusionment the Democrats feel towards the president, uh, the, the typical turnout in a midterm, which is whiter and older, which means it's more Republican, and the way the deck is stacked, Republicans have good reason to feel pretty uh, confident right now, but it's no sure thing by any stretch. Right. If you were advising Democrats right now, what would you say is, is the best bet for them to try to hold on to the Senate? Um, one, they've got to shore up some of these states that they simply can't afford to lose. Uh, and that includes places like Michigan, Iowa, Colorado. Now, in at least a couple of those, they seem to be doing better. They also have to do that in uh, New Hampshire, where what looked to be a very strong re-election campaign for Gene Shaheen against Scott Brown, who really hadn't lived in the state mm -hmm. and a few times has made references to wanting to get reelected in Massachusetts. Whoops. <laughs> um, but that appears to be a toss up right now. They have to shore those up. But so much of this is individual candidates and candidacies. And one of the interesting things is that in a number of these states, like Arkansas, for example, Democrats are making headway by going on the offensive on Obamacare mm -hmm. and the expansion of Medicaid. And what's interesting as well, if you look at the governors who are in right. trouble, and there are a number of Republican governors in trouble, Brownback we mentioned, Corbett in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Rick Scott in, uh, in uh, Florida, they all tend to be from states where the governors refuse to expand Medicaid, which is very popular, not just with poor people who would get the coverage, but community hospitals, the boards of directors, the people who get engaged with them, who are often very uh, much Republicans, are uh, hurting as a consequence of this. And you have some Republicans on the defensive. Right. I want to move on to talking about that right now. Um, you talked about Kansas and Pennsylvania being two states where, uh, where Medicaid could be an issue that really impacts these races. Other races would be uh, Florida, Maine, Wisconsin, Georgia, all states in which the Democratic gubernatorial candidate has promised to expand Medicaid coverage through the Affordable Care Act. The Hill reported this week that this could result in 1.7 million new people being insured. Do you believe the Medicaid issue could end up swinging more, one or more of these races? Uh, it can't be just coincidence that the Republican governors who are in serious trouble all happen to be ones who refuse to expand Medicaid. Mm -hmm. While governors like John Kasich in Ohio romping to re-election victory, uh, partly because he has a very weak candidate, but in significant part because he embraced the coverage uh, that uh, Medicaid expansion brought and said it was a religious duty in some ways, that's helped to make him popular. It hasn't hurt him with Republicans, and it's helped him with independents and Democrats. So I think the refusal to take the Medicaid expansion, which for several years is completely free, and the trouble that it's bringing in these states to the whole infrastructure of the health care system is hurting some of these governors. They don't have a good answer for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the fact is, 
uh, Republicans could have a very, very good year, but if they lose a half dozen of their signature uh, gubernatorial races, uh, lose some high-profile governors, uh, that's not going to look very good. Do you also believe that the fact that Medicaid has been such a good issue for Democrats this time around uh, shows that Americans are beginning to accept that the Affordable Care Act is settled law now? I do believe that what we've seen is Americans don't want to repeal the Affordable Care Act like many of the provisions of the act, call it Obamacare and they don't like it. It's still unpopular in the larger sense, but it's popular in its implementation. And what we've seen is in contests where Republicans were confident that their road to victory would come uh, because of the devastation wrought by Obamacare are hardly even mentioning it. Uh, or if they are, they're just trying to find some way to embrace the popular parts even though they've called for complete repeal. Even Mitch McConnell, the uh, Senate minority leader, uh, who has promised to repeal Obamacare root and branch, has said, well, of course, we'll keep Connect, the very popular exchange in Kentucky that is, at its heart, Obamacare. Right. Shows that people just don't like the Obamacare name. Yes. Norm, thanks so much again for being here. Absolutely, Jennifer. Thanks for watching. Leave your questions about this year's midterm elections in the comments, and we'll try to cover it in a future episode. And please subscribe for all the videos in this series. We're going to see you next week.